Now, our next case is about four young men who drew a great deal of attention to themselves. Several witnesses said of them independently that they simply looked suspicious. And when the men acted, they did so quite brazenly. Our reconstruction begins two months ago near Warrington in Cheshire. This is the Saracen's Head pub at Lynn, where every Wednesday there's an antiques fair. Stall owners come from all over the north of England. And of course, when they do, I just take it off them and put them down because these were new. Joe Fox and his wife Dorothy have run a stand here ever since the market started 16 years ago. It's a rather a small wrist you'd have to have for that because it's been sold to save you losing it. On Wednesday, November the 15th, at about 7, stallholders became worried about three men who were wandering separately around the hall. One wore a brown and white check jacket. One had a dark blue jacket and denims. And the other wore a woolly hat and donkey jacket. How much is this? It's 24 pound. Can you weigh it for me? I'm afraid we're busy at the moment. I'll have it. It's 24. The men hung around for another three quarters of an hour. Three days later, a bus driver saw two men loitering at Manchester Airport's long-stay car park. Well, can I help you? Uh, yeah, um, just want to know where you pay. The driver of the shuttle bus noticed these two men had a small blue car. It pulled out behind him as he drove off. Then, as they approached the exit, he saw another two men in a white Vauxhall Astra, which pulled in behind the blue car to form a convoy. In fact, we now know this Astra was being stolen. After they went through the barrier, the Astra swerved past him so violently that the bus driver noted down its number and immediately reported it to the police. This is four days later, Wednesday, November the 22nd. Well, I guess it's, it's cruising, so it makes it a bit longer. We can push this guy for this one. This one, that one. Some of the stallholders recognised this man from the previous week. Somebody seems to be following us. Do you have any idea who it is? No. God, he's getting close. God's oh. sake! A mile down the road, these two witnesses watched the car chase pass them by. One tyre was now deflated, and when they came to a well-lit area, Joe Fox decided to seek refuge. We don't want to hurt anybody. We want, just want your valuables, right? Your jewellery. Now, where is it? Don't get out. Stay where you are. Now, now where's your valuables? Hey, your jewellery. In the back. It's in the back. As villagers looked on, Dorothy made a run for help. She then ran back and struggled with one of the robbers. This couple called the police, and Joe may have injured one of the attackers. Two hours later, a couple found the Astra abandoned about a mile away. Now that's in Longbutt Lane that the car was abandoned. I gather you've got a pretty good clue to one of the, the robbers at least. 
we're sure that at least one of the robbers will have injured himself quite severely when the cars actually made contact. That's when Mr Fox reversed his Mercedes into the That's getaway right. car. Certainly one of the offender's arms was trapped in the door on impact. We're sure there will be crush injuries to that arm. So he might have gone to seek, in fact, probably did go to seek medical attention. I'm sure he will have had to. And we would appeal to any doctors or hospitals or anybody who knows of a man with that type of injury to contact us. Round about the 22nd of November, they've noticed an injury of that nature if they could contact us. Now, we've got some pretty good descriptions of the people who were going around the Saracen's head at Lim, who seem to be sort of checking it out. Yes. Can you tell us about those people? The first man uh, would be 5 feet 10 to 6 feet, slim build, 30 years of age approximately. He was the man wearing the donkey jacket and the dark coloured hat. The second man would be a little smaller, 5 feet 6 to 5 feet 8, again slim build, mid-twenties, with strawberry blonde hair, which was long at the back. What do we know about the third man? Just that he was about 5 feet 8, stocky build, with dark coloured hair. Then there was a fourth man who might not have been involved in the actual assault, but was seen at Manchester Airport uh, at the car park there. Yes. What do we know of him? He was a man of mixed race, 5 feet 10 tall, 25 years of age or thereabouts, and had black curly hair. Now, it must be said, the shuttle bus driver at the, the car park was very alert. He saw that man by what seemed to be a small, I think it was bluish car, is that right? Small blue car. A difficulty, because of course it was at night, sodium yes. lighting, so the colour might not be exactly right. It could be that was the car that they'd taken in to steal the white Astra, of course. We believe that is the case. What, what do we know about the white Astra? It was stolen on that, on that Saturday, was therefore kept for three or four days before the robbery. The Astra, registered number F994, FUG, must have been kept somewhere during that four days. It had travelled 150 miles, which is not a great distance. It must have been in the general area of Manchester or Liverpool. Okay. We need to know where it was. Don't ring us if you know where that car is now. It's been recovered and is with its rightful owner. Quickly tell us about these uh, two rings here. These are similar to some of the rings that were stolen. Three of these graduation rings from Cambridge University, and the Harlequin Mass Rings, Ladies Gold. OK, the attack on the jewel dealers was much, much worse than we showed in the reconstruction. If you can help, 01811 is the number here in the studio. If you think you can help, uh, you can if you prefer for the instant room direct. That's on 0244 313 131. That's 0244, the code for Chester, 313 131. Our first case is one that hasn't been made public until now because of worries that the gang involved might go into hiding and because of a concern that it could lead to copycat offences. On the first count, police have now concluded the offences are more likely to be stopped by publicity than by further undercover methods. Indeed, there was another offence this morning. To make it hard for others to imitate these crimes, in conjunction with the authorities, we'll be giving you advice. In the film that follows, there are only two actors, the thieves, the witnesses are victims of these crimes who have reenacted the events. Hello? No, sorry, there's no one of that name here. You must have the wrong number. Yes, goodbye. Hello? Oh, it's you again. Yes, there must be a fault. Oh, would you report it? Thank you very much. Goodbye. Getting on all right, Mother? Yes. Anne lives with her mother, Madge, who's blind, and who, last August, celebrated her 100th birthday. There was a party, of course, and Madge brought out a diamond brooch for the occasion, the first time she'd worn it for many years. It was a lovely brooch. We knew it was valuable, and so we had hidden it uh, in a, a jar of semolina. So, of course, I got it out, cleaned it up, and she wore it. And sadly, we had not put it back in the semolina. British Telecom. Oh, yes, come up. I have to get a screwdriver from the band. Oh, all right. Thank you. I thought it was a bit odd, so I went into my mother's room and I saw a British Telecom van 
standing outside there. So I thought, well, that's fine. Ah, hello. Let me pass. Yes. You got a thought on your line? That's right, mm. yes. Right. So where's your other box? I haven't got another box. No, you must have, because, look, you see this wire here, right? Yes. Now, that's, that's got to go into Well, at first I thought they were just quite ordinary people. And then, as the event went on, they were rather hyped up. Have a look around, is that right? Yes, of course. Yes. We kept rushing around from one place to another, and he kept calling my attention to things. Uh, shall it's I have just... a look down there? Yeah, do you want to go and sit with us down there? Oh, hang on a second, love. Look, I've got something to show you. Look, you see this wire here, right? Yes. Now that's, that's leading over towards there. Yes. So your box has got to be over there somewhere. And what's I through see. there? Well, that's my bedroom, but if you want to go in, Can that's fine. Right. Yes, of oh, course, geez. yes. No, nothing in there, is there? No, I didn't think there was, no. Oh, it's got me beat, this one, has. Yes. Oh, yeah. oh dear. Well, it's got to be here somewhere, isn't it? Yes, it has. Oh, no. mm. There's no box in there. No. Yeah. Look, tell you the mm. best thing we can do. We'll go outside, yes. see if we can see the junction box outside the house, all right? Mm. All right, yeah. fine. Needless to say, 30 minutes later, they'd failed to return. And my jewellery's gone. It was, uh, it was quite painful. It's all gone. The valuables have gone. I really felt let down and uh, sore, bruised emotionally, I suppose. I felt very sad, too, and especially I felt sad for my mother because this was her jewellery that had been taken, and this pendant, she had worn it on her wedding day. Now, she was married in 1908, uh, and her mother had lent it to her. Police have so far linked over 80 of these burglaries, all of them in the more expensive residential areas of London, from Belgravia to Hampstead. One of them took place in mid-January, a month ago. Well, it started on the Monday morning. I had several wrong telephone numbers. And then the operator came through to say there was a fault on my line and they wanted to come along to see it. And I said, but they couldn't come on the next two days. I wasn't here. But I made an appointment for them to come on Thursday. British Telecom, yes, come to take I a look at the phones. Uh, how many phones have you got? Two. Uh -huh. One in the hall here and the other in the bedroom there. Uh, where's your junction box? In the bedroom, under the bedroom window. Right. Yes, just down there, underneath the... Oh, the, oh, the back of the drawers, under the window there. Oh, yes, I'll Shall I help you? No, no, I'll Are you fine. sure? We can manage. Fine. We're fine. Any chance of a cup of tea? Yes, right here, then I'll go and put the kettle on. They were cool, very confident and um, looked me straight at the face and everything the one did, the other not so much. He was quieter. How are you getting on? Oh, this wiring's a hell of a mess. How many junction boxes have you got? Only one in the bedroom. You sure? I mean, yes, quite What's sure. in here? Nothing in there, no wires or telephone. Uh, no, I need another junction. Yeah, I feel they did manipulate me. I feel they... Well, they'd got me positioned. They were always well, either side of me. Having it near the junction box in the front. No. It's better to have it further back. That's right, yeah. Well, about that tea then, love? Oh, yes, I'll get that. Tell with it. I'll come with you. Have a look. Would you like another cup? Uh, perhaps later, love. I couldn't believe that I'd been taken in. I felt angry, too, to think that I'd been so deceived and so, well, a confidence trick played on me, and I felt horrible. It's been a bit further down there, perhaps. all those doors. No, it'll be all right, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, where will the telephone go? Will you put up the picture more for you? Yeah, about, better, uh, yes. about ten minutes on this one. Will it? Yeah, it'll be no problem, uh -huh. love, yeah. I mean, my husband's dead now, and they were presents from him. And naturally, I feel, felt awful, horrible. 
as anyone would when you can't, and they're sort of, of sentimental value that you can't replace. I mean, whatever else one might have, it's not the same. One thing about these sort of crimes, Ken Collins, is that they're, they're very dangerous for the offenders because they have to betray their own identity. They can't wear masks and so forth. What, are, what do we know about these offenders? Well, I can give two things. I can give their descriptions first, and then I can tell you about, basically, their, their, the makeup of their character. The first man I would describe as 30 to 45 years of age, 5 feet 9 inches tall, slim build, dark brown hair, and he has a beard and glasses. The second of the two has been described as 30 to 40 years, 5 feet 7 inches tall, stocky beard, a stocky build with a round face with thinning light brown hair. A feature of this man, a number of witnesses have described him as having bright blue protruding eyes. One of the witnesses said they were very confident, so confident that they carried on even though they were under security cameras at times. What, what do we know about the personalities apart from their confidence? Well, they're very plausible. They display a, an amount of technical knowledge regarding telephone engineering. They could in fact be telephone engineers, could they? I mean, real ones, or have been engineers at one stage. There is a possibility. Certainly, uh, British Telecom are extremely anxious to, to catch them. We've put up a £10,000 uh, reward. We've got some copies of paintings that were stolen, which were... Um, they, these are pretty distinctive, aren't they? They are. They're, the paintings that are being shown on the screen now are a few of a collection that were taken. I feel certain that someone somewhere has either seen these, been offered them for sale, or indeed may even have purchased them quite innocently. OK, well, here's the number if uh, you can help in any way, 01811 8055. Or you can call Hampstead Police Station in London. That's 01725 4212. Ask for Hampstead Police Station, 01725 4212. Over the past year, there's been a series of attacks on jewellers who cater for the Asian community in Birmingham. There have now been 17 robberies in all, seven in the Soho Road area of Handsworth. In several cases, there's been gratuitous violence. Shopkeepers were physically attacked, even though they put up no resistance. And the two cases we're about to show you are among those that are causing the greatest concern. In each attack, the gang shouted a torrent of foul language and racial abuse. Now, obviously, none of these matters have been featured in our reconstruction, but police have asked us to show a glimpse of the events in the hope of prompting information from those who may know who the assailants are. Throughout the film, we'll be showing subtitles in Punjabi. This is Amarashu Jewellers at the West Bromwich end of Soho Road. It's seven weeks ago, a night of storms, Thursday the 26th of January at ten past six. The door, as always, was locked. The owners, who've run the shop for eight years, had been visited by a cousin and were getting ready to go home. In reality, the jewellers were both struck by machetes before they found refuge in their workshop. At the Burma petrol station, the gang turned into Oakland Road and then ran across the Oakland Centre football pitch in the direction of Hamilton Road Special School. Five days later, on Wednesday the 31st of January, this Volkswagen van was stolen from Hindriston Street in Hockley, some three miles from Soho Road. It's thought a bus went past as the van was being stolen. If you were near the bus stop or on the 76 going towards the city centre at 6 o'clock that Wednesday evening, please call us straight away. The white van was next seen the following day outside Seattle Jewellers on Soho Road, a few hundred yards from the scene of the last attack. It's 6 p.m. and the owners are closing shop. Ah! 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 
The jewellers were attacked and forced to lie on the floor while the shop was ransacked. Again, there was a stream of racial insults and other obscenities. The van was later found abandoned not far away in Barnard Drive. It's a dead-end road that backs onto the playing field and Hamilton Road School, near where the gang had disappeared before. Inside the van were 30 jewellery trays, now empty and abandoned. Just over two miles away, four days later, this couple were walking their dog across the car park at Swan Pool, just off Forge Lane. These trays came from Seatles. Did you see whoever dumped them here? The detective in charge of the case is extremely anxious to catch these people. We, of course, only hinted at the violence, Mr Williams, didn't we? We have indeed. They were very brutal and uh, sadistic attacks on innocent shopkeepers and their family, including their children, with machetes. And I'm extremely anxious that we catch them before they have the opportunity of attacking anybody again. Perhaps next time we're going to have somebody lose an arm or even worse. Um, and I'm appealing now, if anybody out there knows who they are, for heaven's sake, give us a call now. We didn't show it. In fact, there was a two-year-old child caught up on us. Thank heavens, wasn't wasn't injured. Mm. There must have been witnesses to the events outside in the street who couldn't have realised what they were or didn't realise what they were watching was part of a robbery. Yes, that's quite right. Um, this is a very very busy shopping area, and there must have been many many people shopping at that time of night, not realising what has gone on. Um, I hope as a result of seeing this reconstruction in the programme tonight, they realise what did go on. Now this is 6 o'clock, two successive Thursdays, 6pm, yes. Thursday the 25th of January and the following Thursday the 1st mm -hmm. of Fe February. Now I should say we have a Punjabi speaker here in the studio if uh, you want to call in in Punjabi. The Volkswagen van, that disappeared overnight of course. Yes it did, somebody, somewhere must have seen that van suddenly appear. It was only in their possession for 30 hours um, because it was recovered quite quickly afterwards. Um, we're interested in finding anybody who, who saw somebody have that van quite suddenly. OK, I wonder if anybody knows someone who uh, lost a Timex watercolour watch in the Hansworth area of Birmingham on, uh, in late January, early February. This one was dropped by one of the robbers in one of the, the raids. This clothing was all involved as well. Yes, this clothing has been recovered uh, as a result of our inquiries along with the watch. And uh, what we're trying to do is to identify somebody who owned this clothing and this watch. Uh -huh. What about the jewellery? I mean, presumably some people might have been offered large quantities of jewellery aimed made for, for Asian community. Yes, the jewellery, as you quite rightly identify, it, it is aimed and, uh, towards the Asian community. We're looking to try and find somebody who's been offered it quite cheaply, because there is quite a large quantity of it. OK. Now, again, some witnesses might be a bit concerned about coming forward. I know the, the car park at Forge Lane. It's a mm -hmm. bit of a lover's lane there. I yes. take it you'll use discretion on Oh, on utmost that. discretion, yes. Please phone us. We will use utmost discretion in relation to anybody who calls us with information. Okay. okay, perhaps there's one other thing I should make clear, and that is that the security precautions have since been adopted by most of the uh, jewellers that could be involved in this sort of attack. So hopefully it won't be that easy again in the future. Here's the number if you can help solve this in any way before someone does get hurt much more seriously. 01 811 8055. 01 811 8055. If you prefer, you can call the incident room at Thornhill Road. That's on 021 626 5432. 021 if you're outside Birmingham, 626 5432. Our next case is the robbery of a security van outside a post office in Blackpool. A gang of three men viciously attacked a security guard and escaped with £17,000. The guard was seriously injured, although I am glad to say he's now on the road to recovery. Several of the witnesses who have already helped police on this inquiry have helped us make this reconstruction. It begins on the day before the robbery, that's Thursday, March the 8th, at Blackpool. Blackpool is the holiday centre of the north, with around six million visitors a year. About four miles to the north of the city centre is Cleveleys. The local post office is in the Crescent at the start of Cleveleys town centre. A few doors further on is a barber's shop. 
On Thursday, March the 8th, the day before the robbery took place, one of the barbers noticed two men hanging around the area. You busy? It's very busy, actually. It's, uh, it's An actor plays the part of the barber, although he himself describes what he saw that day. I was suspicious because they were hanging about all day, and every time I went to the window, they were there. Right. On that Thursday, I'd been really busy, and I'd just finished with a customer. I went next door to get a drink from the amusement arcade. The men outside drew the attention of the youth on the bandits. They glanced at each other. Oh, Ernie, just a quick uh, coffee, mate, please. Coffee. No, no sugar. Right. My attention was drawn to the man on the bandit you simply busy? because it was a stranger, and I know most of the people who were in there. The other two men must have walked round the block, because as he returned to his shop, they were walking past again. And in the headlines this morning, a major air and sea search has been carried out in storm force conditions off the Lancashire coast after a man is reported missing. The next morning in Preston, 18 miles away, Susan Myersko drove to work as usual. She parked her blue Ford Escort in the staff car park near the Fishergate Centre at Preston. When she'd finished work eight hours later, her car had gone. Earlier that same day, back in Cleveleys, a post office assistant had finished work for the day. She went round the back of the post office to collect her car. There were two men in the yard. What do you want? This yard is private. I've come to collect a parcel. Oh, well, the office is shut, so you'll have to come back tomorrow. It's very urgent. They've sent me around from the front. The parcel contains parts of my motorcycle, which I really need. Oh, well, I'm very sorry. As you can see, it's shut, so uh, you'll have to go around to the front. Just a few minutes after that, pensioner Jack Evans was crossing over to the post office to send a letter. He was about to become the key witness in a robbery. First of all, I thought it was just three young chaps being boisterous and running down the pavement until I saw the, the masks and the sticks, similar to pickaxe handles. They were hitting the guard about the head and the shoulders and the legs. Don't forget there were three of them, so they, they, they had a good um, coverage of him. Uh, and the middle one was, was kicking him in the stomach to, to, uh, to try to make him leave go of the, of the money. And, and it, was, it, was, it was horrible. It was totally horrible, actually. Jack had twisted his ankle, but he did his best to follow them. Afterwards, uh, I felt somewhat shaky and uh, angry at these people. I thought the sooner they're, they're caught, the better these people and, and, and get their just desserts. Another witness was sitting in his car outside the post office yard. As he chased after them, they turned left into Coronation Road. Seeing them turn right at the top, he decided to take a shortcut. Come on! He lost them somewhere along Victoria Road West. Four hours later, police found the stolen escort abandoned in Cleveleys behind William Hill, the bookmakers. Well, Bruce Dutch, the men seen there on the day before were the same men who carried out the robbery, were they? These two men were seen hanging about the post office, watching the post office, and they must have walked round the block a few times, and their actions were suspicious to say the least. From witnesses, we have been able to complete artist impressions. The first man is five foot eight to five foot ten, early twenties. He's got mid-brown collar length hair with a side parting. The second man is five foot ten to six foot. He has mousy to fair hair 
which is described as spiky on top. He has an angular face and a somewhat distinctive hooked nose. Now that fair-haired man, um, the description fits very much the, the man the post office employee saw in the post office yard on the day of the robbery just before it happened in the red tracksuit. The man with the red tracksuit was seen minutes before the robbery and the witness has seen the artist's impressions from the persons the day before and has described them as being very similar. But it was minutes before the robbery and yet the robbers were, none of the robbers was wearing a red tracksuit so how could he have changed so fast? That's correct. He must have done a quick change act nearby, perhaps in the back of a vehicle. What about the third man who was seen by the barber in the amusement arcade again the day before the robbery? He was seen in the arcade and there's no doubt he was known to the other two men. He again is in his early 20s, he's 5 foot 8 and has dark collar length hair. He was in possession of a blue hold all similar to this one. Just an ordinary navy hold all. That is correct. Right, so if anybody can link those two descriptions and that hold all, if you think you might recognise either of those two descriptions, or if you saw those men on Thursday the 8th or Friday the 9th of March, if you can add any detail at all which may be of help to De Detective Inspector Bruce Dutch and his colleagues, please do ring us here in the studio, 01 811 8055. Or call Lancashire Police Direct at Fleetwood Police Station on 03917 That's 03917, the code for Fleetwood, 6611. Now, it's a measure of the seriousness of our next case that five weeks later, the two police officers who became involved are still suffering from the shock of what happened. One of them, an experienced officer with 12 years service in the Metropolitan Police Force behind him, is not yet able to return to duty. He was very nearly killed. Their colleagues from the Flying Squad in North London are now hunting two or maybe three volatile and highly dangerous armed robbers. In the film you're about to see, is there anything you recognise that jogs your memory? Our reconstruction begins in Palmer's Green in North London at a spot known locally as the Triangle. It's the junction between Alderman's Hill and Green Lanes, which is a main route to and from London, and it's busy day and night. About 100 yards away is Palmer's Green Railway Station, and just across the road, the Nationwide Anglia Building Society. It's Thursday the 5th of April. At about 10 minutes to midnight, a security van arrived to deliver cash. At the same time, the last train from King's Cross calls at Palmer's Green. Passengers emerging from the station may well have seen something of what happened next. Remember, it's 10 minutes to midnight on Thursday the 5th of April. For obvious reasons, we've left out some of the security details here. Stolen Cream Sierra drove off along Alderman's Hill. Unaware that a raid had taken place, two plainclothes policemen were just resuming their patrol. Well, that seems to go OK. Yeah. Not looking forward to the fight for it, though. I think it's going to be a slow one tonight. Yeah? Yeah, my job could do with it, quite frankly. Yeah. The two unarmed officers had been placed on night patrol all that week to tackle a recent spate of car thefts. Well, do you fancy something to eat? What time is it? It's just coming up to midnight. Uh, wait till we get rid of the station, eh? What the hell's he doing? It's worth it. Were you driving one of the vehicles which were forced to pull in as the two cars sped down Broomfield Avenue? Hey, wait there, police! Run! You bastard! Yeah, you are the man! 
Come on, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. I'm going. At you bastard! Yes! Go! Go! You all right? Yeah. Yeah. The men disappeared into pitch dark waste ground at the back of a sports club. I'm not going in there. Call some assistance. Uh, yeah, Yankee Echo 172, require urgent assistance. Uh, Broomfield Avenue, Cranford Avenue, shots fired at police. Moments later, two men sprinted in front of the traffic across Powys Lane from the direction of the waste ground. An alert motorist who'd noticed a lot of police activity in the area flagged down a police van to report the incident. My colleague in the car was shot at twice from virtually point blank range. It was terrifying, thinking that he might any time be killed. He's still very shocked. He's off work and he's seeing a doctor to get over the trauma of the incident. Well, DCI Albert Patrick of the Flying Squad is heading the mission. Mr Patrick, when is the senior officer likely to be able to resume his post? Well, Mark is off sick at the moment. Obviously, he's not well. He's, he's still suffering from shock. He'll get better. Both were extremely brave officers. Uh, that night and uh, very basically the, the robbers were extremely dangerous. It could have been a member of the public. A very difficult uh, position they were in. Because he really did come very close to death. He was literally two inches away from being dead. This could easily have been a murder inquiry and, and thank God it wasn't. Now we are looking for three men. Do you have any descriptions at all? Three men, yes. Uh, they're vague. Uh, best described as the, the gunman who shot at the police officer. Six foot, goatee beard. Uh, the rest is quite big. One white uh, and another one black. So and the third same. one you don't know? Well, yes, exactly. Um, now, these men could have been in the area of the Triangle in Palmer's Green for some hours before midnight, before the raid happened. That's correct. Obviously, they, to plan a robbery like that, they had to be there for some time beforehand or information that were, the timing was right. So we're appealing for anybody who saw two men, three men hanging about the car. Could it have been parked there for some time? Did, did anybody notice it? What is vital is that the man who saw, the motorist who saw the two men running across Powys Lane comes right. forward. He hasn't come forward at all. He didn't give the police officer his name and address. He is a vital witness, so please come forward. You don't have to say who you are, as you said in the night. Pick up the phone and just tell us what you saw. And he was driving a four-door dark-coloured Ford Escort. That's correct. And talking of cars, the gunman used a light-coloured Sierra as a getaway car, which had been told, stolen three weeks earlier in Kilburn. So somebody might have seen that during that time. Yes, they may, but one of the, the crucial points here is where were the plates made up? Uh, that's a, a good point, I think, and uh, we'll appeal to anyone who actually made the plates up. And there's a the number, B329 AAG. Correct. There are two other stolen cars which you're anxious to eliminate from your inquiries or include. I'm relatively happy that, that we can eliminate them, but we just want to be sure. The maestro from Tamworth mm -hmm. was abandoned in Palmer's Green. Now, this was a maestro stolen in Tamworth and driven down to Palmer's Green and abandoned. That's correct. And on the night of the robbery, a Montego was stolen shortly after the robbery or thereabouts and abandoned in Tamworth. So it looks like a straight swap and the areas tally? Yes, they do tally, but we're not sure if they were the robbers. How much hope are you holding out at the moment for this? Sue, can I say that uh, we are struggling. We need help. Uh, it could easily have been a murder inquiry, and I do need just a little clue as to who the robbers are, point me in the right direction, and hopefully I'll be able to do the rest with my men. Let's hope so. If you can help Albert Patrick and his colleagues to trace these gunmen, please do ring us now. This could well be a matter of urgency. As we've said, these are dangerous men. Now, the number to ring here is 081 811 8055, or you can ring the police direct at the Flying Squad headquarters, and the number there is 071 230 2061. That's 071 230 2061. Our next case is a bungled robbery, an attempt to steal a cash delivery from a branch of the Midland Bank on Merseyside. Now, despite the general view that bank raids are fairly common, the truth is that partly because of high standards of security, they're most unusual and they often fail. 
In this case, several members of the public became involved and one nearly stopped the getaway. A reconstruction begins in St Helens, near Liverpool. Wednesday, the 21st of February. On Merseyside that evening, Everton were due to play Oldham at Goodison Park. Half a mile away, arriving for the match, the owner of a dark green Golf GTI parked his car in Utting Avenue. The match was a two-all draw, but the driver lost a lot that night. When he went back to Utting Avenue, his GTI had gone. St Helens, about 12 miles away. It's nine days later on Friday the 2nd of March. This is the Midland Bank on Westfield Street in the town centre. That Friday started as a normal working day for three people who were about to become involved in a most unusual sequence of events. Around half past ten, Group 4 security were approaching Westfield Street, taking a delivery of money to the side entrance of the Midland Bank. I was working a few hundred yards away from the bank, delivering bricks to one of the sites. There was a third man waiting in the stolen GTI. I saw two masked men jump into a Golf GTI, drive towards me. I tried to block them off with my JCB. I jammed them up against a parked car. They scrambled out of the passenger side window. Two of them ran off together. The gunman ran past me and mouthed, I'll have you. He drove the blue Cortina the wrong way down Westfield Street while the other two made off on foot. They ran down Water Road. Maybe you were in the area. Just after I'd crossed over the road and was walking along past Beecham's, I noticed two men acting very suspiciously in that they were running extremely fast, looking as if they were running away from something they crossed over the road so that they were on the same side of the road as St Helens College. I did notice that there was a man in either a Range Rover or a Land Rover parked outside Beecham's. I'm certain that this man noticed the same men that I did. The Cortina was next seen in Duncan Close, which is a dead-end road. Well, when I heard the car come in, so that towards the garage, I looked up and saw this blue Cortina um, shoot past the entrance of the garage. And he went into the builder's yard next door and did a, a wheel screech. As I walked out, I um, saw the car driving off, um, looking, you know, as if he was lost, and went off in a hurry, you know. The car was later found abandoned in nearby Crispin Street. Jim Byrne, you've got some great witnesses and some very good descriptions too. Let's start with the gunman, the chap with the shotgun. Yes, he's a nasty piece of work. Um, his age is about 25 to 30. He's uh, medium to stocky build with uh, dark straight hair. OK, and although it wasn't apparent from the, from the film we've just seen, one of the other guys had an axe with That's him. That's quite correct, yes. This, uh, this lad's more distinctive. He's about uh, 23 to 28 years of age. He's very stocky build uh, with broad shoulders. He was carrying... Um, a hand axe, which was described as a silver-coloured with a black handle, um, a kind to the uh, 
axes used by the fire brigade. Okay, what He's very distinctive because he has a band of uh, freckles across his nose and under both his eyes. Okay, and the third guy, the guy who was sitting in the GTI to drive him off? The third man's about uh, 30 years of age. He's medium to, uh, medium to stocky built with uh, dark straight hair. Now obviously you want to find that Range Rover or Land Rover driver in Water Street who obviously saw them himself. You also want to eliminate a vehicle, I think, from your inquiry. That's quite correct. Um, about 500 yards away from the um, scene where the Cortina was abandoned, a yellow Vauxhall Chevette uh, was seen. Um, the driver and occupants obviously lost um, driving up Borough Road away from St Helens Town Centre and I'd ask the occupants of this vehicle to come forward. OK. Now, taken from the GTI, left there by the, the real owner and, and removed by the robbers, was this jacket which has got coal real fire heating on it, or a jacket identical to this, which is probably British coal. I mean, That's quite correct. Um, these, this jacket, uh, these jackets are issued um, to the coal industry. They're not for retail and um, the, the quite uh, distinctive. Okay, particularly I've seen with these uh, sunglasses, uh, Samco sunglasses by uh, Mazzucchelli, I think they're called, they're reasonably expensive. That they took out of the car, that they left in the car. This was uh, it's a, obviously a training top, it's quite a distinctive training top, and we feel that it belongs to one of the offenders. You don't think they're, they're local men, but even though they bungle this, you do think they're dangerous men. Yeah, much about it. Uh, these men came prepared for confrontation. Uh, they showed total disregard for members of the public. At that time, there was a large number of uh, elderly persons, women and children, in St Helens Town Centre. Um, I feel that by now, the passage of time, these men will have openly discussed this, not only amongst themselves, but certainly amongst their associates. And I'm asking any person with information uh, to contact us here. These men are dangerous. OK, here's the, uh, the number, 081. 811-8055 or call direct to the incident room at St Helens on 51 4090 That's 51 4090 In our next case, a young off-duty police constable was shot in the leg, the bullet narrowly missing an artery as he intervened in an armed raid on a security van in a quiet shopping street in the town of Tankerton in Kent. It was lunchtime on Tuesday the 4th of September, the day that many children around the country went back to school after the summer break. Yes. Do you remember seeing something unusual, either at the scene of the robbery or at the nearby sewage works, which were to play a vital part in what happened? Our reconstruction begins four miles away from Tankerton, three days before the robbery, with the theft of a water authority's van at Hearn Bay. Inside were the keys to all Southern Water Authority premises, including the sewage works at Tankerton. Three days later, on the morning of the robbery, Tuesday the 4th of September, two Water Authority workers arrived at the sewage works for routine maintenance checks to find that the padlocks had been changed. A mobile generator had been taken out of the garage. Inside, everything had been cleared away, but several empty nylon sacks had been put there. The men locked up and left. It's 10 to 12. Just round the corner in Hearn Bay Road, an agitated man called in at this general store. Excuse me, I'm looking for the old waterboard sack. I'm sorry, we've just moved here. Yeah, I was driven down on the dark once. I can't quite remember where it is. I'm looking for the Essex waterboard. No, sorry, the Kent. You might mean the old sewage work sites. It's on the right over there, just round the corner. Just down here? Yeah, that's right. 20 past one. A quiet Tuesday lunchtime in Tankerton Road. Securicore were about to make a delivery to Lloyd's Bank. Two men are waiting. A motorist pulling out to pass the van saw a man run up to the driver's door and point a gun at the window. A second man threatened the other guard. Get back in the van. Don't be at fault. Get back in the van. At that moment, PC Eric Tanner came out of the bank with his girlfriend, Michelle. I'm a police officer. Get out of here! 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 Get out of
Eric Tanner had been shot in the thigh. Get on oh. ambulance! I was mainly concentrating on the pistol that he had in his hand, because uh, at one time I had hold of his right hand and my left hand had hold of the pistol. And I was actually looking at the pistol and I, I thought personally that it was not a real pistol. Gun was pointing at the back of Eric's head and I was hysterical. I thought he was going to kill him. Um, I started screaming at Eric to let him go, which he didn't. Seconds after the robbery, a witness driving along Tankerton seafront had to brake sharply as a securical van, closely followed by a red Austin maestro, shot out in front of him. The speed at which they were travelling made him suspicious, and he decided to follow them. His suspicions were confirmed when the van and the maestro took a turning through a housing estate heading towards the sewage works. He made a point of getting a good look at the maestro driver. Get a move on! They changed the locks! I'll drive through it! Just beyond the sewage works is the seafront. A man taking a lunchtime stroll saw a white minibus reverse onto the grass embankment. It's less than 10 minutes since the robbery took place. The minibus was found abandoned four miles away later that afternoon, behind the Tesco Superstore in Whitstable. Shoppers may well have noticed four men carrying heavy bags. The money they took weighed approximately ten stone. PC Tanner hopes he'll be back at work in the new year. I uh, have recently been to the physiotherapist and they think I should be getting back on the road now and well, I can put some weight on my leg. So I'm, I'm not too bad. And the thought that Eric could have been killed, seeing that gun pointing at his head, is what has frightened me since then. Um, and I think probably that's why I've been more upset by it than Eric has, because he was never really aware that his life was in danger to the degree that I was. Well, Mr Taylor, there were four men involved in the robbery and you have three good video fits. Yes, we have very good video fits of three of the offenders and I'm sure that they're identifiable. Right, well, let's have a look at them again. Um, first of all, the agitated man who asked for directions to the sewage works. Can we have his description? Yes, he, he fits very closely to the description of the man who actually shot PC Tanner and he's described as being in his mid-30s, six foot four inches tall, and he's a big man Muscular, not fat, and, but described as about 17 stone with dark or brown wavy hair. Now that's the man on the left hand side of the screen. In the middle of the screen is the second man, the one driving the red maestro which closely followed the security all van. What's his description? A smaller man and older. He's per perhaps about 40 years of age, 
uh, dark hair with, uh, with his moustache. Um, the most distinguishing feature about him is that he's got narrow eyes and he's of Mediterranean appearance, a swarthy appearance. And then the third man, the one who drove the Securicor van on the right-hand side of the picture. Yes, he's uh, again a man in his mid-thirties, six foot to six foot two tall. He's got brown to uh, mousy coloured hair, perhaps greying, and I think it's uh, probably a bit lighter than he's shown in the video fit. Right. I, I think that it's worth saying that if, if you view, view all three of these together, uh, somebody may recognise them, and if they do, I would urge them to call our incident room. Right. And all those three men are between the ages of 30 and 40? Yes, that's right. At the beginning of the film, we saw a National Rivers Authority van being stolen inside with the keys to the Tankerton Sewage Works. That's not f so far been found? No, it hasn't. I'm, I'm convinced that that was involved in the robbery. The keys fitted the barrier to the promenade where the white van was driven from. And I feel that that vehicle has probably been abandoned somewhere, perhaps with false plates, and we'd very much like to find that. Right. Tankerton is a small seaside town and Tankerton Road is a very quiet shopping street but do you think there may be witnesses who have not yet come forward to the robbery? Yes, it's quite possible. A lot of people have come forward. Uh, we would urge anyone who, who hasn't, who has information about the robbery to come forward but I would also like to hear from anyone who was in the area at the time just so that we could eliminate them from the inquiry. Right, and once again the date was Tuesday the 4th of September, the day that many school children went back to school. That's correct. Do you think these men were locals? One of them didn't know the way to the sewage work, so he presumably wasn't. No, Tankerton's a, a fairly quiet seaside town. I would think they're certainly out of town, if not out of the county. Let's have one more look then, finally, at those three men. There is a substantial reward, isn't there, if anybody can recognise these men? Yes, Securicor have offered a reward of £25,000 uh, for a successful conviction and the recovery of the money. I think perhaps it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, the size of that reward reflects the seriousness of the offence. These are obviously dangerous men and we need to catch them before they shoot somebody else. All right, Mr Taylor, thank you. If you do recognise any of those three men, either individually or, as Mr Taylor said, you may know them as a group, please do ring. If you think you can help, here's the number here in the studio, 081 811 8181. Or you can phone Mr Taylor's, Taylor's colleagues direct at Kent Police Headquarters on 0622 690909. That's 0622, the code for Maidstone, 690909. Our first case is one in which almost everything went wrong. A road accident which jammed emergency frequencies as a security van tried to call for help. A cash box fitted with a smoke bomb that, almost unheard of, didn't detonate. A police officer who found himself in pursuit without a radio, and the only good part of the story, a gun that wouldn't fire. It's Saturday afternoon on Allerton Road in Allerton, which is four miles southeast of Liverpool city centre. PC Graham Picken had been policing a local football match and was now to take a bike for an official test ride. There was no radio, no siren, and the blue flashing lights weren't yet wired up. At about 3.15, Securicor arrived at the British Gas showroom on Allerton Road to collect the day's takings. As the guards went into the showroom, you might have noticed two men who were loitering nearby. I came along Allerton Road and uh, as I passed Hargreaves, saw a large crowd of people looking down Lyondale Road, crossed over the central reservation. What's going on? Oh, PC Picken wasn't yet sure precisely what had happened and unable to radio for assistance, he set off down Lyondale Road. The escort turned right into Elm Hall Drive and then accelerated away across Queen's Drive. Stop bleeding! Go now! 
shit. I was just staring down the barrel of the gun. Um, the thoughts, I suppose, were confusing. I couldn't describe my feelings. The car did a sharp left onto Penny Lane. Travelled along Penny Lane at 60, 65 miles an hour. I was staying at a safe distance behind the vehicle in case he did discharge the gun. The vehicle then turns into Everton's Lane, and knowing it was a dead end, I turned round in Greenbank Road and went back to the end of Penny Lane where the bag had been dropped. I was thinking that maybe the gun was in the bag. I went back to the end of Ibbotson's Lane. You just abandoned the car down there. Thank The three men ran across Queen's Drive into the grounds of Mossley Hill Hospital. But where did they go from here? Well, that's what Frank Hope wants to know. You've at least got descriptions of two of the men. Yes, the uh, fellow that had the shotgun, he's uh, about 30 years of age. He's quite small, he's about five foot six, short, dark hair with a, a sallow complexion and a Liverpool accent. Uh, the man that had the handgun, he's slightly taller, he's about five foot eight, again, late 20s, uh, short, dark hair, and again with a Liverpool accent. What do we know about the driver? The only thing about the driver, he's got blonde hair, uh, was wearing a baseball cap and a dark jacket. Or perhaps a scouser like the others? Possibly, yeah. Now, there's no doubt somebody watching tonight knows who these people are. It's a good bet, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. Your concern is that these guys were, were pretty dangerous. I mean, those guns were loaded. Yes, we recovered one uh, live uh, shotgun cartridge, so they were quite prepared to use the gun. Uh, they're, they're dangerous people, and they're prepared to go out with live ammunition. As far as I'm concerned, they're quite capable of discharging and, and necessarily killing somebody. OK, well, in case you did see any of these events, but perhaps didn't recognise it, let's retrace the, the, the chase and spot exactly where it was. Remember, this is 3.20pm on Saturday, the 27th of October. Uh, at two points, the gunman got out of the car. First of all, uh, where the car crossed the junction of Elm Hall Drive and Queen's Drive. Now, there were two witnesses there. Inspector Hope, only one of them has been traced. Yes, we traced one uh, lady. Now, there was a lady getting into a white car which was parked on Elm Hall Drive. And in fact, the, uh, the officer on the motorbike shouted to her to phone for the police. Now, this lady's never come forward. We need to speak to her. Very important that she rings the studio. Yes. OK, fine. Then, of course, the, the chase continued. It went down Penny Lane, and the car stopped at the bottom of uh, Penny Lane. Now, this time, of course, this is where the gunman got out to threaten PC uh, Picken, and a black bag fell out. And here is the black bag. Not much in it, but uh, a couple of fairly ordinary-looking... Two uh, There's nothing startling about them, but they're fairly new, and we're hoping someone might uh, remember selling them. OK, the car was uh, abandoned down Ibbotson's Lane, as we saw. Yes. Then there was this jogger. Yes, now, it... he obviously tried to help, but probably doesn't know you still need to talk to him. Yeah, we, he's obviously the, the, the person who saw the driver's face. Now, he's never come forward, despite us asking for him, and we certainly need to speak to him quite well, He might not have heard local appeals. What do we know about him? He's about 50 years of age, grey hair, and was uh, just in a dark... Uh, jogging tracksuit. Okay, now the men ran off, as we said, into the grounds of Master Hill Hospital, and uh, they were not, after that uh, escape, after they went across the wall there, seen again, unless, possibly, it was they who were seen by a witness about an hour later. Yes, so the, the lady who uh, saw them with a the shotgun, um, she's convinced that the she saw a maroon escort about an hour later on uh, Chilwell Five Ways. There was the driver of the car. Um, and three others in it. Now, she's convinced that the man who had the shotgun was amongst those people in that car. 
Now, obviously, they've uh, never come forward, but we'd like to speak to them if, if for the simple reason, just to eliminate them, if no better reason. OK, if it was you and you had nothing whatever to do with the raid, do please call us. Here's the number if you can help in any way, if you saw any of that or think you might have done. 081-811-8181. Let me remind you, too, if you think you know who did it, there's a reward. You can call the Instant Room direct at Garston if you want on 051-777-4846. That's 051, the code for Liverpool, 777-4846.